Okay, it seems we're live for the moment, and so we'll do our best, uh, except... Hmm. There we are. Okay. Um, we are on a pop-up vacation, which means that we have to do a pop-up uh, live session. And so this is session 101 of the Carl Jung Depth Psychology Reading Group. And I'm hoping that this is working out all right. Um, if, um, if you're, let's see. <laughs> Okay, so we'll see, we'll hope that this works. I got knocked off line once, and so if it doesn't work, we'll resume next week. Uh, <clears throat> but I had some things uh, to s set aside here, and so I see that I have at least one person listening. So let me start. I'm going to be reading from... Um, C.G. Jung's Psychological Reflections, a new anthology of his writings, 1905 to 1961. Uh, these will be some short quotes in order to give time for others to join us on the feed. And uh, then I'll read some other uh, things that I think are important for this week. Um, if by any chance uh, Thomas Dennis is here online, would you please say hello? Uh, because I want to read from your book next. And so I want to uh, speak to you about that. Anyway, um, these are quotes from Dr. Young. Masses are always breeding grounds of psychic epidemics. Um, so... Uh, Dr. Jung was always anathema to large masses of people, wherever they were. The next quote is, Who are we to imagine that it couldn't happen here? We have only to multiply the population of Switzerland by 20 to become a nation of 80 millions, and our public intelligence and morality would then automatically be divided by 20 in consequence of the devastating moral and psychic effects of living together in huge masses. Such a state of things provides the basis for collective crime, and it is then really a miracle if the crime is not committed. It has filled us with horror to realize all that man is capable of, and of which, therefore, we too are capable. Since then, a terrible doubt about humanity and about ourselves gnaws at our hearts. And so if you're here and you have access to chat, uh, say hello, and hopefully I will see it. Unfortunately, when I have to broadcast off my iPhone, the chat uh, messages disappear very quickly. So sometimes I'm not able to see them. But tonight, instead of looking at my other uh, local followers, which I will be doing next week, uh, I am looking at the screen, so I should be able to see you better. And so uh, the next quote I'm going to read. The common man, who is predominantly a mass man, acts on the principle of realizing nothing, nor does he need to, because for him the only thing that commits mistakes is that vast anonymity conventionally known as the state or society. But once a man knows that he is or should be responsible, he feels responsible also for his psychic constitution. The more so, the more clearly he sees what he would have to be in order to become healthier, more stable, and more efficient. Once he is on the way to assimilating the unconscious, he can be certain that he will escape no difficulty that is in, 
that is an integral part of his nature. Next quote. If a man is capable of leading, if a man is capable of leading a responsible life himself, then he is also conscious of his duties to the community. Since everybody is blindly convinced that he is nothing more than his own extremely unassuming and is insignificant and insignificant conscious self, which performs its duties decently and earns a moderate living, nobody is aware that this whole rationalistic that this whole rationalistically organized conglomeration we call a state or a nation is driven on by seemingly impersonal, invisible, but terrifying power, which nobody and nothing can check. This ghastly power is mostly explained as fear of the neighboring nation, which is supposed to be possessed by a malevolent fiend. Since nobody is capable of recognizing just where and how much he himself is possessed and unconscious, he simply projects his own condition upon his nature, and thus it becomes a sacred duty to have the biggest guns and the most poisonous gas. The worst of it is that he is quite right. All one's neighbors are in the grip of some uncontrolled and uncontrollable fear just like oneself. In lunatic asylums, it is a well-known fact that patients are far more dangerous when suffering from fear than when moved by, lar than when moved by rage or hatred. So, welcome. This is the 101st session of the Carl Jung Depth Psychology Reading Group. And I see that we have some uh, subscribers here, so I'm wondering if Thomas Dennis is here. If you are, say hello, Thomas. Uh, I'm about to read a portion of Thomas's book, uh, which is called Never Snicker at a Snake on a Stick by Thomas N. Dennis. Uh, and um, what I was reading from before, Chris, just so you know, is C.G. on Psychological Reflections uh, and a new anthology of his writings, 1905 to 1961, edited by Yolanda Jacobi and R.F.C. Hull. Um, now, um, Thomas Dennis is one of our subscribers here, and he's written a new book. It's called Never Snicker at a Snake on a Stick. And I do not know why my uh, picture is reversed here. <laughs> As you see, my part on my hair is in the wrong direction and so on. So maybe um, someone will tell me how to change the direction of my vision. But anyway, I won't talk in reverse, so you'll be able to hear. And tonight I've selected a piece of uh, Thomas's new book, Never Snicker on a Snake on a Stick, um, because there was a synchronicity involved, which involved a, um, involved a visit to India. And since I've made 44 visits to India since 1994, um, I have a special affinity to things Indian. And so I thought I would read this. Uh, but in the course of reading it, I think that you should consider buying this book because it's a good example of how the psyche works and how uh, Jungian psychology works. So uh, I'm, I'm beginning on page 25. Feign normalcy, she said to herself, and the words gripped her brain. She saw bumper stickers, story titles, an entire genre built upon those two little words. 
Lavinia wondered if it was too late to write another line of her obituary. A long piece of legal work she'd been a long piece of legal work she'd been at since the downturn of 1985, when suddenly there was a lot of time to not work. It had turned into more than a mere legal document and was her most prized piece of work. Handwritten with a soft tip pen on distended graph paper, she might add this into the concluding remarks. Feign normalcy. Successfully pretend to be who you are supposed to be. The house was a long way almost the house was a long way from almost anything. And she had a garage to park in, but yet she remained outside it, kicked back the seat and lounged, staring into the darkness outside the car until she could distinguish some stars. Quote, the sorrows of life are caused by a bipolar existence, a split of the one into two, because the truth of things is oneness and not the apparent dual form of the existence of anything. The dual form creates an ambivalent attitude of like and dislike at the same time between one pole and another. Love getting suppressed when hate super love getting suppressed when hate supervenes, and hate being driven underground when love gains the upper hand while the fact is that both these attitudes are simultaneously present in an individual, and only one of the aspects comes to the surface as when the occasion demands. Human nature, thus, is in a state of perpetual conflict. It is never a state of balance between its two compulsive attitudes. To get back from duality to real unity is the process of sadhana, yoga practice. How much of any of this do any of you believe? Monday night's class was starting. He let them sit stewing in this for a little while longer. And an unbiased observer could easily discern how anxious everyone was to begin moving, how pent up with energy, how pent up with energy all these humans were, how pent up with energy were all these humans. It begged to be spent, and you could see it in every tick, every twist and side bend as the clock's big hand moved toward the top of the room. Murmurs amongst the ponytailed girls, the people warming up, twisting, sleeping, sitting quietly. The room was warmer, quite by accident, than he'd hoped for it to be. He thought back, couldn't really help it, to some particularly intemperate rooms near the mode to some particularly intemperate rooms near the motel in Yernabad, India, where he and his wife, who was then his fiancée, had stayed while visiting in 1989. As Bert's father and others of that earlier World War II generation saved up money for the retirement trip to Berlin or Stockholm or Zurich, this later generation robbed from the 401k for cheap packages to Pune into the streets of Calcutta, the Himalayas. This yoga center was now a great moneymaker for the region and spiritual economic engine of great good growth for this area. Of this, of this much, Burke was certain. There was a big sign when they got off the airport property, which looked to be painted on the skin, which looked to be painted on a skin of some kind. To reach the center, <laughs> let me share this the way it looks in the image. Okay, so to reach the center. Okay, so it's like a sign. To reach the center, the center is located at 30 kilometers from Coimbatore, the closest city 
airport code is CBE. You would have to take a bus from Gandipuram town bus stand to Tanir Pantal, stop just before the Pundi terminus and trek the 0.7 kilometer stretch by foot. Or rent a call taxi, approximately 350 rupees from W. Thongsong to get here. Sorry, my Indian accent isn't very good. He had read the first part of the sign quietly. Various golden bits of string flew figure eights around his neck and forearm, and forearm as he waved at them. Trek the 0.7 kilometer stretch by foot. I love it. Or rent a call taxi. That's what it says, Babu, she said. Pundi terminus. Oh boy. What do we think a call taxi will be? Burke said he didn't know. A call taxi might be one old asthmatic Asian man who would insist on ferrying them one at a time in cow carts to a common destination to a common destination, all for a tiny fee. So they checked it out, both Burke and Emmy, thinner and a good bit more adventurous in the early nineteen eighties, but this heat was more extreme than anything he'd been cautioned against. It seemed to rise out of the bit it seemed to rise out of the buildings. A heat expressed from a handshake and from everyone else you ran into as you meandered along the old part of Yernabad. It is the equatorial heat, Sahib. If she didn't stop calling him Sahib, there was going to be a huge argument. Choleric rashes of an astound choleric rashes of an astonishing variety raced out onto his skin, shattering much of his shattering much of his equilibrium shattering much of his equilibrium somehow. He'd been just barely capable of doing a balanced tree pose, but not that for very long. These erythmatose blotches, these erythmatose blotches all over his face seemed to mark him as the white guy. Yet overall, it was still quite exciting just to be here, even if he hadn't found the purported guru yet. He was supposed to be awaiting Burke's arrival for a t he was supposed to be awaiting Burke's arrival for a talk of some kind. Wasn't there a giant river they had to cross? Slipping back to the present, Burke remembered he was teaching the class. I'm sorry if I seem distracted. I was just thinking about some of the miserable time I spent in Yernabad, India, a couple of decades ago. He tried the winning George Harrison-esque half-smile on them. Yeah. I think you'd be, I think you'd all rather just do the yoga and go on home tonight. Am I right? Nods of assent. Okay, you can skip the philosophy and we'll go straight to the poses. From mountain pose, raise your arms straight up, breathe, arms to straight out, exhale. He watched Lavinia to make sure she was breathing in these poses, saw the rise and fall of her chest in the red t-shirt and black tights. Right, pay attention to the breath, Berkeley. Yet the outpress of the nipples in the crimson fabric, he couldn't help it. How old was that woman? He couldn't tell for sure, lower forties? The expression on her face was one of rapt attention, one of the more unself-conscious ones he considered of all the faces here. A peculiar face, the corners of her very narrow lips seemed upturned in a half smile. But he knew she was not amused. It was not a smile, but just the shape of her lips. Her brief dark brown hair was chopped short in varied lengths, obviously unbrushed and untended, a gamine effect. He realized it was he and he alone who got to see all these faces relax, eyes shut as everyone closed down for Savasana. He could tell by now who was relaxed and breathing. 
and breathing well and who was suffering from sinus problems. People don't like to keep their eyes closed too much of the time. Forward bend, he commanded, and all followed his command. Bend the legs, relax the head, ragdoll head hanging loosely. Sighs swept through the room. When he met the guru, he discovered that in this particular limit, when he met the guru, he discovered that in this particular lineage, it was pro forma for the disciple to give his wife up to the guru for sexual pleasure if the guru so desired. I can't do that, he told the calm man with the red bindu on his forehead. Then, smiling beatifully, smiling smiling beatifically, not all, not at all put out, smiling beatifically. Then, smiling beatifically, not at all put out, you may not be my student. And that was that. All he told Emmy, until a few months later, was it didn't work out. If pressed, he expanded. The classes are all too full, he said. When he finally told her what the real problem was, she was nonplussed. I could have done that for you, she said. Berkeley was just puritanical enough to be aghast at this statement. Berkeley knew, even after the awful trip to India, that he shouldn't marry Emmy. Yes, the sex was good. Yes, she was a wonderful girl. And yes, she loved him furiously. It was a dark love, an affection that was too dependent. Something in him recalled, something in him recoiled at the red-headed ferocity of her affection. And though he did his best to forget about it, this may be as close to true love as you ever get in this weird world. It was, of course, only a matter of time before it all came crashing down. Five years. Okay, so I've been reading from our subscriber Thomas Dennis's book, Never Snicker at a Snake on a Stick. And I read that particular portion partially because of the synchronicity of I opened the book and there was an interesting um, story about India where I have a lot of experience and and partially because I wanted to talk a little bit about this type of uh, sexual abuse that occurs in religious organizations and to uh, warn everybody that in receiving our um, inputs from ourself, from our unconscious, there are two streams. One is good and one is bad, and you have to make a decision. And so obviously Berkeley in this story made a decision against turning his girlfriend over to the guru. but. We are seeing these sorts of abuses coming up in religious organizations around the world, and it's time for all of us to call a halt to it. And, um, you know, evil is not something that's in another world. It's in this world, and we need to start calling it out. So... Um, this week, um, sorry. Okay, well, we still have some people following, so I'm going to read from a different book, and uh, I will try to respond to anything you put on chat um, if I see it. Uh, so uh, I was reading from Never Snicker at a Snake on a Stick by. Thomas and Dennis, one of our subscribers, but now I'm going to be reading from The Unshuttered Heart, 
Opening Aliveness, Deadness in the Self by Anne Belford Ulanoff. And Dr. Ulanoff, as many of you know, um, I did briefly see that chat message come up, but not long enough so that I could read it, unfortunately. But anyway, good evening. I did see that it said good evening. Um, anyway, so as many of you know, uh, Dr. Ulanoff is uh, uh, Emerita Professor of Psychiatry and Religion at Union Theological Seminary. And Dr. Ulanoff has written 16 books by herself and another six with her husband, Barry Ulanoff. And so tonight I'm reading from her book, The Unshuttered Heart. And I'm going to first read the introduction to this book, just to share it with you. Whenever I ask anyone about instances of feeling alive, aliveness thrumming through them, they answer immediately with examples varied and fascinating. Standing in a misty rain, seeing the grape leaves she was picking, silver and glistening, making the whole world soft and beautiful. Watching the birth of his child, stunning, incredible, the total coming of sexual orgasm. A moment of clicking, the outer meeting of the inner, a sense of, I get it, I get the whole thing. To ask about deadness is harder, but examples arrive. Absence of being there, no vitality, attention going in all directions as if losing it, not able to gather myself, energy gone, something of me has gone missing. <clears throat> Analysis is about renaissance of this inestimable experience of feeling alive and real and about regenerating from its opposite, deadness. Deadness includes death, especially loss of ones, especially loss of ones we love, loss of country, loss of youth from the physical and psychological maiming of war, of famine, of mud and dust of refugee camps. But more grave still is deadness from but more grave still is deadness while we are still alive as if some part of us has been driven into exile and we cannot get it back. In keeping with the vitality of these experiences, I do not want to step back to summarize the book's chapters. Instead, I want to stay with the main theme of feeling alive and real and with the basso ostinato of deadness and how deadness threatens and joins aliveness in vigorous counterpoint. Circling around the main variations on the basic theme of aliveness, deadness, begins with the impact on me of terrorism in my city on 9-11. Our new century opening under that shadow cast into bold relief for me the preciousness of life and what we are living for what we love and what we find worth dying for. And when I got to that point in the introduction, I was reminded by the wisdom of Don Juan DeMarco, who was the character played by Johnny Depp in the movie Don Juan DeMarco. And um, he said this, which I think is worth repeating. There are only four questions of value in life. What is sacred? Of what is the spirit made? What is worth living for? And what is worth dying for? And what is worth dying for? The answer to each is the same, only love.
The answer to each is the same, only love. Okay. So, carrying on. Now I'm continuing with the introduction of Anne Olenoff's book, uh, The Unshuttered Heart. My theoretical base in addressing these questions reveals a motif repeated throughout these chapters. My analytical work, rooted in Jung's approach to the psyche, though other theorists whom I have read and taught, exert strong influence as well. Aliveness for me leads to livingness, a process, not an acquisition. Aliveness, as we circle around it, named and unnamed, cannot be captured, but only symbolized. That fact delivers us into precincts of psychology and religion, two refrains that resound throughout the book. The psychological question asks, what makes for aliveness in analysis as that makes for healing? Sounding and resounding variations of this question do not yield a succinct answer. It remains mysterious, but the mystery of the mystery is that it shows itself. It is visible. Healing turns round and round aliveness without exhausting its power. Deadness deadens our perception of aliveness, makes it invisible to us, and us invisible to it, and evil seeks to dismantle it, to disavow its actuality, to say nothing is there. The religious question asks what we believe of the reality our symbols point to that makes us feel connected to the source of aliveness. What do we name it? Or do we leave it unnamed? For the clinician, this is an urgent question, because that belief, whatever it is, influences what we hear, how we listen, shaping the complexities of rhythm, of, of internal, of voice in analytical work. The impact of terrorism rehearses a well-known motif. The impact of terrorism rehearses a well-known motif that we belong to each other and to something greater that holds all of us. The familiar fugue of our dependence and interdependence recalls their vertebrate integration that working on oneself enlarges society and working to enlarge society and working to enlarge social space among diverse groups makes possible new depths in oneself. Even our personal faults connect as if by a hinge to the impersonal violences we to the impersonal violences we do to each other. Thus, psychological work and spiritual practice form a kind of social action. To find a method to hear all these interconnections, these intersecting variations on a recurring theme of aliveness and deadness, yields to us a more ample consciousness capable of hearing simultaneously different ways of making meaning. We can listen to how our past causes present interpretations, how our present takes us to future aims we had not yet guessed, how our conscious and unconscious mental processes can combine to expand our awareness of the whole surround so that all parts can be heard as well as the whole they make up. Aliveness, then, is to make something of what we hear and to hear what we hear makes and to hear what we hear makes of us. Aliveness then is to make something of what we hear and to hear what we hear makes of us. Our heart becomes unshuttered. In, in, 
In ending this beginning, I want to express my gratitude to the persons who generously gave permission to cite their material, my analysons with whom it is a privilege to work. Okay, that was from the introduction. And now I want to read from the beginning of chapter one, <clears throat> which is called Aliveness and Deadness. Under the shadow of terrorist attacks on American soil and engagement in war on foreign soil, these questions become urgent. What makes for our sense of aliveness and feeling real as persons and as a people, a country and as part of the whole human foul and as part of the whole human family on this earth? What puts us in touch with our own voice and confers a sense of finding and creating a path that is true for us, while at the same time recognizing that others take different paths? What kills our voice? What makes our deadness? What is the nature of that generative space where we enhance our capacity to be real? To what and to whom? Do we belong? Those of us in New York City are still hemmed in by such questions, still in grief for those killed and in our fearful wondering if when they knew they were going to die, they also knew in their last moments the reassurance that they had truly lived their life, that they had lived according to the mystery of their own vocation and felt they belonged to a larger whole, or whether they felt unlived life, undared thoughts and actions, life they should have risked now cut off, murdered. We also feel urged by the suffering of neighbors, friends, and victims to seize the life we are given with both hands and not dawdle, not delay, not evade, but live full out with all our hearts and minds and strength to reach to the bottom and find a foothold in the meaningful, the worth dying for, and to fulfill that meaning, fully to fill our everyday living it, touching it, f fully, to f fully to fill our everyday living it, touching it, sharing it. new century and millennium. These kinds of questions assaulting us after the trauma of 9-11 and the subsequent terrorism of 311, Madrid, 77, London, 723, Sharm el Sheikh, let alone repeated attacks of suicide bombings and, repri and reprisals in Iraq, Afghanistan, Israel, and Palestine, alert us to the changing paradigm of our new century and millennium. The overarching question of the 20th century, I suggest, was being versus non-being. How could we be and go on being in the face of so much destructiveness, so much inhumanity, from the world wars, from the racism, gulags, holocausts, forced marches and starvations, the persecution of any among us and any parts within us that differed from the collective norm of being. In the face of such nothingness, how could we be and have faith in being? The paradigm I see, the paradigm I see emerging in this 21st century is no longer cast as the verticality of being versus non-being of the 20th century, but a new horizontality. We look across the whole world and talk about it being a global village with multinational corporations extending business across continents, where internet and webbed connections, let alone television, bring the far into the near, 
the remote and foreign into the familiar living room. The sheer mass of communications puts the spiritual question to us of how to be alive and real and linked to the center of the midst of this bustling life, no longer removed into cloister, but in the marketplace. Can we reach and dwell in the still point in the midst of the whirling world of competing countries, values, and populations? Can the individual find her myth of meaning, his joyous, spontaneous self-expression while contributing to the group-oriented consciousness that seeks to look into, not just at, the laws by which energies of life operate? In its subatomic particles, its nature of light, its alternative methods of healing, its intrinsic psyche its intrinsic psyche matter connections. The new question, the new question for our new century, I suggest, is how to be committed to realness when all feels relative, to find and create an unfolding path and live it full out with all our hearts, minds, souls, strength, in the midst of others finding different paths. Can all of us in our multicultural, multi-religious, multi-political societies live together? Can we endorse that what we share in common are our differences? Can we recognize that we all look at the same origin point? Aliveness happens in the space between what we find and create. The space between investing wholeheartedly in specific forms of therapy, of faith, of allegiance, and simultaneously non-attaching from them. We embrace our own path and accept others' differing paths. Like, like spokes of a wheel, we all turn around and round the center. Circumambulation replaces linear progress. The space in between holds the whole. Our question is no longer being or non-being, but self and other, other and self, whether we are talking about splits of psychoanalytic groups, political parties, nations, religions. Even in trauma, we must learn this both and inclusion. As a woman whose husband and father of their young two children killed by the plane crashing into the Trade Tower, said, the collective nature of 9-11 is what is so hard. We cannot escape its anniversary, nor make it just our own. The children in anger say, but this is our grief. Why must we also face all these other people marking it? They feel invaded and are still seeking in their unremitting sorrow how to find room for their own loss in the midst of everyone else's loss, the country's loss. Okay, now what I wanted to do um, <clears throat> was read something about clinical work and about this idea of aliveness and deadness. So I'm on page six, and I'm reading from in Belford Ulanoff's The, uh, the Unshuttered Heart. And I'm sorry if it's backward in your viewing. I don't know how to change that when I'm broadcasting from my cell phone. I'm, I apologize for that. The space for clinical work pushes the two people around to make space for the work to be done. Jung calls this the archetypal field, and we feel it, and we feel it as a force, a current, a placement in psychic reality. Jung names the self the organizing pattern of energy in this field that gathers all the parts of the psyche around a center. I am always asking, what is the self-engineering? 
how is it maneuvering us, indeed shoving us, pulling us, wooing us into positions where we can experience the reality it connects as where we can experience the reality it connects us to here and now. The self is the process of the analysis. The self is the process of the analysis, or the process of the analysis is how we experience the reality the self discloses through the totality of the psyche. By assembling both our consciousness and what we are unconscious of around a center, making us, making us feel all of the psyche in us and between us and the analyst. The self gives access to both people as they are positioned, arranged to witness the reality the self brings into view. Jung calls this actuality the unis mundus, meaning the whole reality, inner, outer, self, other, individual world, psyche matter. Let's see if I can get myself in the center of this picture. The space for conversation between our conscious ego and the unconscious self is not just an individualistic indulgence which critics of depth psychology aver. Jung's notion of individuation cannot be accomplished except with other people in concrete settings of social, political, and daily interaction. It occurs in the midst of living, in the body literally and symbolically, for body means definite forms in a specific time and place in Congress with others. Becoming all of once, becoming all of ourself, including all parts, responding to a mysterious summons issued to everyone, a vocation to create that path that has been laid out for us, requires responses and responsibilities to others. As Jung says, one cannot individuate on top of Mount Everest or in a cave somewhere where one doesn't see people for 70 years. One can only individuate with or against something or somebody. The self and individualism exclude each other. The self is relatedness. Becoming all of our being always begins in slime, in indeterminate hints, flashes, all mixed in with everything else, like a tiny plant issuing upward from a group issuing upward from a root in the mud. This is aliveness coming into being. To come into our own aliveness, we depend on another's interest in us, seeing us coming alive to the power of livingness in us. How amazing to see each in Alessand crafting her or his own way of relating to the unconscious. Some people are visual and images catch up, catch up their emotions into relatable forms. Others are auditory and hear a hum when things click and a sound of jarring chalk on the blackboard when things don't. Some people do not think or pray in words. They think in the key of A minor or only in the color red. The question is put to us, with urgency in this first decade of our new century and millennium. Are we like a good plant making oxygen and the oxygen each of us makes is breathing space for all the rest of us? We, be we desperately need every citizen making her or his share of oxygen for the planet, for creation of social space that can hold opposite views and create enough room to find and construct peace. Where one part of us seeks dominance over the whole, we have fallen into identification with one point of view and split off and projectively identify any opposing view with the enemy out there. Such tyranny makes for deadness. In pathology, we see addictive clinging to a part object 
and hurling onto others all the other parts we disown. Without a big enough space between the opposites, the alive, the alive question, what went wrong, turns into the dead-making question, what did this to us? We lose the whole object and grab instead the part object split off from the whole. Our inner neglect of all the different parts of us that press to be included to sustain a big space of conversation between them mirrors the outer neglect of whole parts of our country, of parts of the world where citizens still do not have a blanket or a bottle of medicine or enough to eat. If there is no conversation with others, then there is not enough conversation going on between the ego and the self. If there is no conversation between the ego and the self, then there is not enough conversation with others. So, um, so that's all I'm going to read for tonight. I thought it was quite apropos. Let me... Um, repeat here the alive question, what went wrong, and the dead-making question, who did this to us? And so uh, I would ask each and every subscriber that's listening to this to ask those questions of yourself, what went wrong versus who did this to us? So. I will focus on the chat for a couple of minutes here and see if I can answer any comments or questions. I'm going to cut it a little short since this is a vacation week for us. And so as you see, I'm not in a usual place where I normally run my uh, reading group. This is the 101st session of the Carl Jung Depth Psychology Reading Group, which began on June 1st, 2016. And so if you haven't explored the other um, videos on this YouTube channel, I would urge you to do too. There is a world and wealth of information available to you there. Um, are there any other comments or questions that you might have? before we terminate this call, or this uh, session. Okay, uh, if you happen to be a member of our advanced reading group, uh, we will not be holding a uh, seminar session on this Wednesday because our, um, our vacation is going to con continue through Wednesday. And so, uh, thank you, Gray. <laughs> nice to hear from you. Um, by the way, now that I realize you're there, let me see if I can find... Uh, uh, there was something in this book that was very appropriate to teachers. And um, I found it. Uh, this is later. Uh, so I'm reading from... Um, Paragraph uh, Anne Belford Ulanoff, uh, The Unshuttered Heart, and I'm on page 72. And so let me just read this, this piece about a teacher. I remember fourth grade teacher of our son. His father and I would go to parent teaching would go to parent teacher teacher conferences, sitting in those tiny chairs at little desks. The teacher was shy, hardly looked me in the eye, did not give any direct answers to my maternal concerns. Yet with this teacher Yet with this teacher, I have seen my son bloom. Yeah. 
as if a red geranium blossomed out of his heart, out of his head, as if a red geranium blossomed out of his head. How did this happen with this wary person? He loved his teaching, and the children flowered. What is this mysterious power to make connections, to make something alive, to inspire, to steady, to chasten, and to excite? It is a tremendous power that it inheres in all of us. When psychologically we take the root of madness, and when spiritually we hate the spiritual, we want to push this creating power into other people, make them carry it, make the religious system carry it. We flee this freedom. We fear it. We want to get rid of it by making the, a god out of someone else, something else. This is where religion turns fanatic, indeed demonic, and, ask, and acts as a portal for gross inhumanity to each other. Even in the privacy of the two-person relationship of analysis, both analyst and analysan face the task of embodying this power. The philosopher, theologian, Jean-Luc Marion, sums up this ethical and community dimension in his meditation on the human face. The face of the other in our consulting room is the place from which we are seen. In the face of the other, we experience being seen. We experience another world. We are not alone in that world. There is another external player out in the world as I am. This reception of the other breeds ethical connection. The unviewable face of the other's gaze only appears once I understand by, by surrendering to it that I must not kill it. Certainly, I can always kill the other, but then it will disappear as a face, it will freeze as an object, and I will know that I am a murderer. And I will lose being, and I will lose being seen. Thus, the other's face must not appear as an object, but as a call. It is invisible because it is a place where I see that I am seen. Um, I just, as you can see by my reaction to this, I found this um, bit about the teacher very moved, moving. Um, and I'm going, to, I'm going to just read that chapter, that paragraph, one more time. I remember a fourth grade teacher of our son. His father and I would go to parent teaching teacher. His father and I would go to parent teacher conference sitting in those tiny chairs at little desks. The teacher was shy, hardly looking at me in the eye, did not give any direct answers to my maternal concerns. Yet with this teacher, I had seen my son bloom as if a red geranium blossomed out of his head. How did this happen with this wary person? He loved his teaching and the children flowered. What is this mysterious power to make connections, to make something alive, to inspire and to steady, to chasten and to excite? It is a tremendous power that inheres in all of us. So I'll just leave it at that. I thought of you when I read that. Anyway, uh, so any other thoughts? <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's laughable. <laughs> we have that under control. I would absolutely agree with that, Greg. <laughs> no, we don't have it under control, but uh, I think all of us can look back on teachers that we had that did make us blossom. 
I think especially of a social studies teacher I had in the eighth grade. His name was Frank Kehoe. And Frank had, had a tremendous piece of wisdom. He said, read everything. It doesn't matter what you read. Read Mad Magazine. Um, because if you read a lot of things, you will learn. And so you can read comic books or whatever it is. And I, uh, you know, that's a piece of wisdom I always carried with me. It certainly is. Um, and so, anyway, okay. So, um, I'm going to, um, take a take a dive now but uh, just to observe uh, next week the local reading group has uh, arranged to meet again at Sammy's Pizza Kitchen so we will be operating off the iPhone uh, again next Monday night at 8 o'clock but the other members or other local members will be in attendance and um, I don't know what we're going to talk about yet. Maybe we'll talk about uh, something new from everyone. Um, and I will try to have a, an iPad with me, which would allow me to um, follow the chat better than we've been able to on previous live sessions like that. Normally when I'm operating off the computer, I'm able to... Um, see the chat right along and go back to earlier parts of the chat, but I cannot do that when I'm broadcasting live like this. Let me just see if... Uh, no. Okay, that, I, I thought that was uh, giving me the possibility of doing that on my screen, but that's not working out the way I'd hoped. So anyway, I will see you all next week, and there will be a day off for the advanced reading group on this Wednesday, and we will be meeting next week on November 7th, where we're going to continue with our uh, seminar on ION, Researches into the Phenomenology of the Self. So if there are any questions on that, please write to me in the meantime. And I look forward to seeing you all next week. And I'm going to sign off if I can. Let's see if I can do that. <laughs>